and C-SPAN 2. Now let's go to the other side of Capitol Hill. The House Rules Committee has been meeting since 5 p.m. Eastern. It's setting up the rules for debate on legislation for prescription drug coverage. They're also working on the rules for debate on legislation covering energy and water spending for fiscal year 2001. We join the meeting now in progress. It provided less cost. Uh, thank you very much, John. Thank you, Mr. Slater. I'd like to first point out that some of those HMOs are pulling out of Georgia, at least because of the 900 pages of regulations that HICFA has drawn up to enforce their activities and their, and their coverages. Let me ask you this. Uh, about two-thirds of the seniors have some kind of a health care benefit, I'm told. Activities and their, and their coverages. Let me ask you this. Uh, about two-thirds of the seniors have some kind of a health care benefit, I'm told. I mean, I mean, prescription drug benefit. Is that correct? I guess that's about right. Yeah. Who insures them? Who insures them? It, many of them may not have insurance. Uh, Mr. Linder, they may have a union plan, which is a retirement benefit. It's not insurance. It's a contractual benefit. Uh, for instance, the AFL, CIO, the Teamsters, the auto workers provide as a retirement benefit. Uh, executives may have the same thing from Ford and General Motors as part of their retirement plan. You and I would get our retirement uh, from through the through the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan, depending on which plan we took. I doubt if any of the members in this room belong to an HMO under the Federal Employees Health Benefit Plan, but if they did, it would come as a contract right. I get my health insurance from Blue Cross. So if when, when I take Medicare benefits, uh, I would get my drug benefit as I do now through the Blue Cross did, fee for service plan. Do those union members still get their health care coverage through their retirement uh, contract too? They, they are, if they're over 65, they're undoubtedly getting Medicare as the primary payer. Why aren't they still but, in their health care? But as you, as you know, Medicare does not provide, except in very few instances, any pharmaceutical benefits now. What's going to stop all of these people are getting pharmaceutical benefits through their labor union contract or their employer and retirement? or what else from dropping that coverage, just like they Absolutely did when Medicare Absolutely nothing, and that's the reason you need the Democratic plan. Which they is are going dropping to coverage which is going to right and coverage. left. Union plans, company plans are dropping coverage or raising the premium that they're charging to the retirees, and the managed care plans are dropping coverage and going out of business. Mike, it's exactly the reason we need an adequate, guaranteed benefit as we have in the Democratic my plan. My question, that is not, I didn't ask you that, Jared. My question then to you is, does your estimate of $100 billion over five years anticipate that those two-thirds who are currently covered will drop theirs and you'll be paying for them two under the $100 billion, or does it, it anticipate it tripling it? It anticipates as near as those who estimate these things can that there will be a significant number of people who will opt in to the Medicare plan or continue to drop the coverage, as many companies do. It does, in fact, pay something directly to those plans to encourage them to continue them. But it, if they don't, there is a Medicare plan. So we're going to subsidize provides. those plans? We are going to subsidize the individuals, not the plans. I just one more question. Using easily quantifiable usage statistics, a 1964 Lyndon Johnson projected the cost of Medicare in the year 1990 for this great nation, rich nation. Mm -hmm. You remember what that projection was? Far lower than what we're spending today by probably 10% of what we spend today. Uh, pro less than that. Okay. And Medicaid was going to cost us $1 billion. Mm -hmm. And you know what it cost us? It cost a couple hundred billion, $76 billion? Uh, okay. 1990. Yeah. Are you pretty comfortable with your numbers on this one? Am I comfortable with the fact that we spend that much? No, are you comfortable with your estimates of, of $100 billion over five years on this one? I'm as comfortable as you can ever be, Mr. Linder, and if I'm wrong, I hope I'm way on the low side because I hope they discover something new that will make you and I healthier and live to be a happy, ripe, 100 years old, as healthy as you look now at 30. God forbid. And I want to tell you, that would be the proudest day of this country if we could provide that kind of medical care to you know, we got 12 million children who aren't insured. We got to get to that too. There's a lot of things we have to do, and the insurance companies aren't doing it, Not and they won't. The you and I cats. have to do it well, here in Congress. Insurance. Thank you.
John Linder's 30, then Deborah Price is uh, 16. 25. So happy right. 16. You. And I'll leave it at that and pass. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Mrs. Myrick. <laughs> Mr. Sessions. Yes, Chairman. Uh, I've not had a chance to go through your whole bill. Is there a decision making process that would be made in your plan after the doctor writes a prescription? In other words, when a doctor writes a prescription and they give it to either a pharmacist or to the patient, is it taken? Bas basically, no, there is not. In so other words, no changes. The what the doctor ordered is what the patient gets. With the exception of perhaps some drug that is not in general usage as an effort to control cost, but the, ph the pharmaceuticals that are generally prescribed today, uh, a person could go to any provide any retail. They could order through mail order plan. They could go down to the corner pharmacy. But they don't change the generic or the brand name or the anything else. Sure. What the doctor writes. What the doctor writes. By and large, is what they get. Precisely. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your uh, Chairman, I thoughtful have a, uh, testimony. Statement from Mr. Dingle. Thank well, you, without objection, Mr. Dingle's statement will uh, appear in the record. Please give us our little bitty waiver, Mr. Your Chairman. Your message come through loudly, loudly and clearly, thank Mr. You. Stark. Thank you very much for being here. Now we're happy to recognize uh, what Chairman Archer described as the uh, architect of the uh, plan that uh, has come forth from the committee, my California colleague, Mr. Thomas. And please. Uh, Feel free, if you have any prepared remarks, to uh, submit them for the record, uh, and they will appear in their entirety there, and we will... Mr. Chairman, I don't have any uh, prepared summary. remarks. I would rather uh, respond to statements that have been made that uh, really, really do need to be corrected, Good. clarified, and elaborated on. And just let me say that the... Uh, the real differences between the two plans, even taking the uh, plan that uh, I've just seen, which uh, I believe uh, the Democrats are going to offer and ask you uh, to make an order, um, that there are really uh, fundamental differences, but that there are an awful lot of similarities, and that both the President's and the Democrats' plan today are much more similar to the bipartisan plan than either was a month ago. Um, the most uh, ironic uh, process has been that every time the president or the Democrats criticize the bipartisan plan, they run back and change theirs to make it look more like the bipartisan plan. Uh, the gentleman from California is a well-known critic of the Medicare Plus Choice program, yet in the Democrats' plan, they have new monies going into Medicare Plus Choice. Uh, they were uh, not inclusive of a real insurance program with catastrophic, yet today both the President's and the Democrats' plan uh, have catastrophic. But I guess what disturbs me the most was an attempt to get a handle uh, on what I consider to be the cornerstone of what the majority was required to do in building a prescription drug program for seniors while reforming Medicare. The budget resolution said that $40 billion would be made in order for Medicare modernization and prescription drugs. As a matter of fact, the Democrats' alternative on the floor of the House, and they could have put any number they wanted to in there. They could have put $100 billion for the prescription drug program. They could have put $200 billion. They could actually have put in as much as the gentleman from California says he wants in a Medicare program, but they didn't. The Sprata budget on the floor said $40 billion. As a matter of fact, every budget said $40 billion. And so my concern is that while we were operating under uh, the budget resolution that guides uh, the way in which we budget today, it may not guide us next year. It may not guide us next month, but it guides us today. We present to you a CBO certified Medicare modernization and prescription drug program that CBO scores as $40 billion. 
Let me give you a brief tour of the Democrats' proposal. If you'll take a look at their, uh, the outline of their bill, on page two under section 1860, uh, they provide a 50-50 assistance program, as do we. That particular provision in the first paragraph costs about $35 billion alone. The second paragraph under section 1860B is, they say, a catastrophic or stop-loss plan that we offer in 2003 for the $40 billion total at a $6,000 maximum payment by the individual, they're going to offer at 4000 That addition alone is $40 billion. Now, how are they going to pay for it? All you have to do is turn to their plan, and on page 5, under section 103, um, stop me if you've heard this before, the, Demogra the Democrats propose to spend money we don't yet have or counted. They are anticipating if the, if the midsummer 2000 budget estimate results in a higher level of projected on budget surplus, then they're going to use it for the catastrophic benefit. In fact, the bill itself and the bill language says that the catastrophic plan starts in 2006, not in 2003. When the president's plan starts, 2006, they don't have it in their plan, but they create the illusion um, that it's here. There are some other things that we do, and frankly, uh, they're overdue. And I want to point it out. In Section 102, it has to do with the relationship of low-income uh, individuals who also happen to be seniors. They're called dual eligible. And for years, these seniors have been treated in programs that have been shared between the state and the federal government. Well, not all states share evenly. And so seniors in one state might receive benefits far greater than seniors in another state. The way they say it from an insurance point of view is that Medicaid, the state program, is primary, and Medicare is a secondary payer. What the bipartisan plan does is says, if Medicare is a federal program for all eligible seniors, then a senior who is low income ought to be a senior first and low income second. And so over five years, the bipartisan program moves the funding of this program from the states in a crazy quilt, uneven way to the federal level to be handled consistently so that if you're a senior and you're low income, you are treated equally in every state in the United States. Their plan keeps Medicaid primary. They don't make it a federal program for seniors, notwithstanding anything they may have said. And then to the questions that I heard earlier about how our plan is somehow privatization of Medicare, whereas their plan keeps it inside Medicare. That's simply not true. The bipartisan plan is inside Medicare. It is an entitlement. But they'll tell you that there's a public-private partnership, and therefore, we're really not in Medicare. I invite you to take the bill itself and turn to page 12. And let me read you from their plan. This is the Democrats' plan that they're offering for more than $100 billion. Section 1860G. One, use of private benefit administrators provided for under parts A and B. The secretary shall provide for administration of the benefits under this part through a contract with a private benefit administrator. What's the difference between the bipartisan plan and the Democrats? The Democrats have one private administrator. Republicans have two or more. We provide choice, they do not. But the charge that ours is privatized is exactly open to them as well. But they don't tell you that. 
Take a look on page 16 of the bill. On line 26, A, privately negotiated prices. You sat here and thought that the Democrat proposal would provide a government-guaranteed price structure so seniors would not be thrown to the wolves about whether or not the private sector would negotiate a plan for the seniors. Page, 26, uh, page 16, line 26. Each benefit administrator shall establish through negotiations with medicine manufacturers and wholesalers and pharmacies a schedule for prices for covered prescription medicines. Negotiated prices under a private administrator. That's the Democrats' plan I'm reading. So when they tell you theirs is different than ours, theirs is under the government Medicare program and ours is not. That simply is not true. What we have done is built a true insurance product guaranteed to stop the hemorrhaging of seniors' money for the amount of money available under the budget resolution. Now, are we going to have more money next month or six months from now? I certainly hope so. I have a number of areas that I would like to, as we did last year, invest in Medicare. Monies that if made available will be invested. But I can assure you that doesn't slow down the Democrats. In Title IV of their bill, they spend the money we don't have between 20 and 25 billion on top of the other amounts that I have indicated to you of money that isn't available. I would ask only one thing of you, Mr. Chairman. If you make a democratic substitute in order, please require it to be within the budget resolution. I think it's inherently unfair that one group is required to write a plan that meets the needs of seniors as best you're able for $40 billion, and somebody else blows in here, and I can assure you blow is the right word, and says that CBO won't score our plan. The reason they won't score the plan is because it's still warm from the Xerox machine. It has been changed from the time they presented it to committees. It has been revised every five minutes when we announce what we're doing and somebody's poll shows seniors respond positively. They changed their bill. But please take a look at those sections I indicated to you. Their plan is more than $100 billion. And how fair is it for us to go to a plan subject uh, bring a plan to the floor subject to the budget resolution of $40 billion being responsible but being ready, willing, and able to deal with more money when and if it comes, or somebody who throws together a plan for three times the budget resolution and says, okay, let's have a fair fight. The money isn't there, it shouldn't be spent. Thank you very much, But Mr. let me Thomas. just briefly say that if you listen to any other amendments that are going to be made in order, mm -hmm. please consider the budget resolution right. as well. It's 40 billion. There are a number of very worthwhile amendments that are going to be offered, but you have to add their price up as well. Well, thank you very much. You make a very compelling argument about living within the constraints of the budget resolution and also about the open-ended uh, aspect of that other proposal. And uh, so I appreciate your clearly outlining that for us and the request that, uh, that you have made of this uh, committee. Mr. Goss? Mr. Moakley? Mr. Linder? Do you have a number? Do you have a number as to the average per capita cost of prescription drugs that seniors use per year? Yeah. Um, CBO has estimated uh, today the approximate amount is about $1,500. Is that high? When both uh, uh, the uh, suggested Democrat proposal and the President's proposal up until last Saturday when he revised it once again uh, and the bipartisan plan were designed to go into effect in 2003. At that time, CBO estimates that seniors' average drug costs at that time will be about $2,000. So we're trying to build a plan projecting to what the average cost of a senior is going to be three years out. In 1965, 
virtually every physician and dentist and provider in America had it, filed to our patients that they treated for free. That was their community responsibility. And the patient, the provider said, pay me when you can. It happened all across America. After the government decided it was their responsibility, that didn't happen any longer. Today, according to this weekend's Washington Post, there are drug companies, major drug companies across this country that will provide for anyone who can't afford the prescriptions, drugs necessary, access to them. What will happen to those programs? Well, if you put in place a program that's going to fund 100% of the drug costs of seniors below 135%, there certainly would be no need for a low-income program. We would hope that in working with the pharmaceutical companies who have created this very positive outreach program, that we can begin to adjust those seniors in need, notwithstanding the fact they're slightly above the poverty level distributions in both the Democrats' plan, the bipartisan plan, and the president's plan, and that we begin to integrate, especially with those states who have more generous programs than the federal government, that we don't diminish the total resources available to us for seniors. But if you just go in there willy-nilly and throw money at it, then you're going to find people who are saying, well, you know, what am I doing? And they're going to pull out. It needs to be a coordinated effort. And ironically, that effort would be a continued public-private partnership to make it work. A term that my Democrat colleagues seem to choke on, uh, when in fact, in today's Medicare, notwithstanding the gentleman from Texas's comment, it isn't a government program. Even the monitoring of the delivery of services and the payment of the bills are carried out by private contractors in today's Medicare. Thank you. Price. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, for your efforts. Um, last week, we had a quick discussion about um, some concerns of the um, drugstore, the pharmacists, and um, independent chain, whatever, about how they felt that this plan was uh, perhaps cutting them out of serving their customers. And you helped me understand a little bit uh, from your perspective why that is not the case. Could you share that with the committee, please? This is liable to be a point of uh, contention. And in, in most of these instances, it reminds me of the uh, Nixon-Kennedy debate over Cuomoy and Matsu, when, in fact, they were both saying the other side of the same coin, but somehow there seemed to be a political advantage arguing one or the other. Uh, we have um, placed several modifiers in our bill to make sure that there is maximum comfort level in the rural areas. We do have the ability today to deliver prescription drugs by mail, but that should never be the only way in which prescription drugs are provided. And in fact, we say that it shouldn't be just mail order. We have a provision in the bill which says there has to be, as we say, a bricks and mortar pharmacy available for emergency services. So if you have a bricks and mortar pharmacy already on board for bricks and mortar emergency, situated where it is appropriate, it's an easy next step to incorporate that pharmacy into an overall program. The difficulty, of course, is that just as in the Democrats' plan, there are private entities who administer the prescription drug program. We call them uh, pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs. The concern would be that if you put in a phrase, as we did in the bipartisan bill, that there must be a convenient pharmacy for the beneficiary, that if the plan defined convenient, you and I may not think it was so convenient. So the convenience definition will be one that's determined by the new Medicare benefits administrator, not the plan. And that will provide two sources everywhere in the U.S. Uh, I, I just might mention that, in fact, uh, one of the reasons we create the Medicare Benefits Administrator to oversee this particular area is that because the Health Care Financing Administration simply has not shown the necessary sensitivity and ability to work with the beneficiaries uh, that you would want. Uh, it's, it's a lot like trading your accounting department for your sales department. No one would ever do that in a business. Hick was good as a finance agency. They're not very good as a benefits manager. And more and more, the kinds of programs we're putting into Medicare, Medicare Plus Choice, the prescription drug program, 
is a competitive model that requires negotiation with the people delivering the services. But more importantly, it requires an educational role with the beneficiary to understand how they're going to best be able to use it. And the healthcare financing administration has been a disaster in what we would call warm and fuzzy, touchy-feely beneficiary relationships. And the Medicare benefits administrator's charter and responsibility is to do the kinds of things to make sure that the convenience factor for the seniors in the pharmacies is carried out. Now, we don't just trust someone who becomes the Medicare benefits administrator. We have an oversight board made up of public and private individuals who make sure that the charter of this new agency under the Health and Human Services Department, part of the structure to deliver the services, but a new one focused on seniors' real needs, make sure that, for example, something like convenience for the beneficiary is in fact carried out instead of simply being a word on the books. And in the Democrat um, substitute as, as uh, presented today, who manages the benefits? Uh, it would uh, be retained in the Health Care Financing Administration, that uh, agency that has failed to meet eight straight statutory requirements to change uh, the funding program, uh, which created a 34-page information booklet that contained seven pages of telephone numbers for the seniors. They feel perfectly comfortable leaving the complete administration to a new program hundred billion dollars according to their program when they can't even do the workload that's pre been presented to them by statute. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Chairman, I have uh, a question. Thank you, uh, Chairman Thomas, for going through this uh, distribution channel. There was a conversation about a uh, provider in Maryland that the gentleman from California, Mr. Stark, referred. Are you aware of that? <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, the company's called Merck Medco. Um, they just happen to be the pharmaceutical benefit managers for more than 1,000 uh, major businesses. They have more than 52 million lives that they're responsible for. And if uh, any of you here uh, carry with you uh, the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal Plan, I think you'll find the prescription drugs for the plan are supplied uh, by Merck Medco. Uh, so the argument that this is somehow a fly-by-night organization, um, again, this is the moving target of the Democrats' uh, uh, objections to the bipartisan plan. First of all, it was no insurance company in America would write this program. Uh, well, it turns out that Merck Medco is the only company in the United States that has its pharmaceutical benefit managers licensed to take risk in every state in the union. They are already in place. The Forest Service agent in Alaska has a program ready to go under the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. What we're going to do is emulate that and have two programs at least available for seniors everywhere, and I'm pleased that a company that is comprehensive as Merck Medco, the largest deliverer of managed pharmaceutical benefits in the country, has been willing to sign a letter and say, we're ready to go, we'll write policies under the bipartisan plan. Well, of course, as soon as they did that, they were then uh, a, a target to be trashed. Because, after all, if no one was going to write it, they were okay. When someone stepped forward and said they were going to write it, then they've obviously got to have fault somehow, and you begin to then tear down someone who, in fact, today supplies prescription drugs for 52 million Americans. Appreciate the clarification. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, could you uh, detail how the rural counties will benefit under the Medicare Plus uh, choice changes in the plan? Well, I thank the gentleman for the question, and uh, one of the uh, interesting uh, points, and I don't believe the gentleman is here when I made it, was uh, that when the bipartisan plan was first made public, there was major criticism, including uh, the gentleman from California, the uh, ranking minority, uh, for throwing more money at the Medicare Plus Choice program, that they're already overcompensated, which is a line that he uses uh, quite frequently. 
uh, and that uh, it was just irresponsible to talk about putting more money into the Medicare Plus Choice Program. Of course, what we also do in the bipartisan plan is pull it out of the Healthcare Financing Administration, which has never understood it, doesn't know how to deal with competition and negotiated prices, is pretty good with a hammer and a saw, but not real good with a nurturing, negotiating structure, and put it in the Medicare Benefits Administrator structure. But then we said we wanted to raise the floor. We wanted to put it at $450 above where uh, it is today and it's planned to go. We have a way to compress the national uh, high and low county pays so that we can speed the process up. We went ahead and put more money into those areas that have one or no plans. Now, I want to hasten uh, to indicate to you that uh, the plan that was uh, presented uh, by the Democrats as their plan under Title III uh, has, mm, let's see, Increase in the national per capita Medicare plus choice growth percentage. Increasing the minimum payment. The floor will be raised to hmm, $450. Uh, allow uh, a blend. In other words, once they realized that the uh, rural areas wanted to be treated fairly, and they haven't been treated fairly, the Democrats simply picked uh, up wholesale that portion of the bipartisan bill and incorporated in theirs. Now, that's not bad. That's good. I wish they would take all that we have because then their plan would only be $40 billion. Instead, they just kept on going and they got $100 plus billion. The low, and, uh, low income and rural areas deserve to be treated just as fairly as, if you'll excuse me, Long Island and Miami. And this plan moves them far more rapidly in that direction than the current structure does. We plan to do more if and when more money is available. And we want to do it this year. Unfortunately, in the budget resolution, we don't have a lot of money in 2001. We have more money in 02 and 03. Our goal will be once we identify and know the amount of money available on the rebase, we want to invest it immediately, including, for example, doing things like changing the date of announcement of withdrawal, pushing it back so that people aren't unnecessarily disturbed uh, by plans announcing they're going to leave and then at the 11th hour uh, money arrives. That's a project that we need to begin working on just as soon as uh, we pass the bipartisan Medicare modernization and pres prescription drug plan on the floor this Wednesday. Mr. Thomas, thank you very much. Thank it's you. Been a very uh, helpful testimony. Oh, Mr. Frost, I'm sorry. Well, I knew you were guess coming. Is going. that uh, most questions have been asked, uh, Mr. Mokley? Did uh, have we neglected to ask Mr. Thomas anything? No, I didn't ask him. I was waiting for you. <laughs> You're right. Most questions have been asked. Uh, I, I would, I, I would love to ask Mr. Thomas one or two questions because I was out of the room. I have a feeling the answers will be uh, a little bit repetitious, but I may take the opportunity to ask one. Or two. Certainly free to do that, Mr. Thomas. Um, it's my understanding that, um, and you may have already covered this, that there is an announcement today that the uh, budget surplus uh, is going to be much larger than originally anticipated, uh, both for this I'm, year. I'm sorry, I had trouble with your tenses. There is going to be, there, there, there is there, an announcement there today an, that there was an, it was to be an announcement today. I don't know whether it's actually been made. It appears in Congress daily, publication that's all sent to us. That yeah. the, uh, who, who made the announcement? The, evidently, the President's Office of Management and Budget. Do they govern congressional budgeting? I'm, uh, Mr. Thomas, I'm asking you a civil question. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand. The uh, President's Office of Management and Budget is in the process of announcing that the surplus will be, and that under their projections, will be larger for this year than originally anticipated and significantly larger for the 10-year period than originally uh, anticipated. My question is, assuming that the Office of Management Budget is correct in their estimate, what would, be, what would your objection be to using some of that surplus to make a larger prescription drug plan as the Democrats have suggested? When are we going to know that we have the money? Well, I, evidently the announcement is being made today. 
But I believe the gentleman knows that the executive branch uh, determines its money by the Office of Management and the Budget, and that the uh, Congressional Budget Office makes the estimates for Congress. We are not able to spend other people's estimates of the money. I am anxious to make sure that we've built the best program we can with the resources that we have. As soon as someone hands me more resources, I would be more than willing to invest them wisely. But if we don't have them in hand, I would be loath to spend it. Under the gentleman's party, we ran red ink for years. Once the congressional budgeting process was in the hands of this new majority, we are getting the surpluses that will allow us to reinvest it. And as soon as someone tells me I actually have the money, not the checks in the mail, but we actually have the money, then I would be more than willing to sit down on a bipartisan basis and spend the surplus so that seniors have an adequate program. However, with $40 billion to spend, I have to say the bipartisan plan spends that $40 billion very, very wisely. We can always accommodate more. We have needs in Medicare beyond the prescription drug program, however, and I think we need to address those as well. well I'll, our I'll hospitals, read. our skilled nursing facilities, our home health care institutions, uh, and uh, making sure that the Medicare Plus choice is funded as was promised, in which this administration has never done. Well, I'll be happy to read the uh, gentleman, uh, the uh, news report in front of me. Uh, speaking in the Rose Garden, this is today, uh, President Clinton said the OMB is predicting the unified budget surplus for this year would total $211 billion, the largest on record. Excluding Social Security, the on-budget surplus this fiscal year is projected to be $63 billion, including a $24 billion surplus in the Medicare account. Over 10 years, the unified surplus would total nearly $4.2 trillion, including a Social Security surplus of $2.3 trillion and a Medicare Part A surplus of $403 billion, leaving a non-Social Security, non-Medicare, on-budget surplus of about $1.5 trillion. Now, I recall that when the gentleman's party uh, controlled the executive branch, the gentleman's party venerated the uh, uh, project projections of the Office of Management and Budget. Now, the gentleman perhaps doesn't agree that the Office of Management and Budget is making accurate projection projections right now. But I'm just asking you if we can assume, and let's, we ought to look at this. I mean, clearly the President has made this announcement today. We ought, to very, we ought to examine this. Assuming that the Office of Management and Budget is correct, is in the ballpark, uh, why couldn't we use some of this money for a better um, uh, prescription drug proposal? I would tell the gentleman, uh, I hope the Office of Management and the Budget uh, is correct. But uh, under uh, Article One, with Congress controlling the purse strings, our uh, institutions determine whether the money is there for us. The key term, I thought, is predicting. Uh, and the gentleman read me a very enticing press release. One of the major differences between our parties is we spend checks that are certified. You folks spend press releases. And I'm not ready to spend a press release. As soon as the money is there, I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and figure out how we can allocate these wonderful surpluses caused by the failure to pay, uh, by, the, by the willingness not to spend the way it was spent in the past, and invest it in a number of areas that need money. I'm excited about that. I would like to do it, but we don't have it yet. Why in the world would we spend money we don't have? As soon as we get it, I'm more than willing to help you spend it, but I only want to spend the money we know we have, not the money we wish, we hope, a press release says we might, is predicting. That we and have. that's why the gentleman wants to give that $40 billion or a substantial portion of it to private insurance companies rather than having the plan run by the federal government. It's interesting in terms of how the money is spent, regardless of what the figure is. Uh, uh, I, I, I heard the know. gentleman's earlier comments, and I would invite him to look at the Democrats' uh, bill. And if he would, with me, turn to page 12, 
The administration I, I of the that. Democrats' plan. Which, which bill are you talking I'm about? Reading, I'm talking about the, the bill that the Democrats are hoping would be made in order. It says up on the top, FP6, Health, Med, Drugs, Dems, 40.004. And if you turn to page 12 and look at uh, line 19, it says use of private benefit administrators as provided for under parts A and B. It goes on to say, the secretary shall provide for administration of the benefits under this part through a contract with a private benefit administrator. Of course, the gentleman knows that that's exactly the way Medicare is administered right now under fee for service. And it yes, is a government pro and it is a government program with contracting the administration yeah. of the program, not the determination of benefits of the program. No, no, and no. What no. you would do would be to determine this hand this over to private insurance companies that may or may may not actually offer the benefits and that may say, oh no, we can't do this. It's very nice that Mr. Thomas has a bill and that, Cong that the Republicans have a bill, but we don't want to offer these plans because we can't make any money doing it. You leave it to the whims of the private insurance industry to actually offer the plans. We're not talking about the administration of the plans because currently Blue Cross and Blue Shield administers Medicare, fee-for-service Medicare in many jurisdictions. We understand that, but it's a government plan. I'll tell the gentleman, with all due respect, my friend from Texas is flat out wrong. I don't believe that I'm wrong, Mr. I Thomas. believe you're wrong, and I'll tell you why. All you need to do is read the bipartisan plan. The president's plan and the Democrats' plan take 100% of the risk. The private contractors are hired to carry out the job. There is no shared risk. One of the consequences of that, of course, is that whenever you're spending other people's money, you're not as really forthright about trying to save it as much. Under the bipartisan plan, it is possible for the Medicare Benefits Administrator to subsidize risk up to 99.9% government assumption of risk. Where plans are not willing to partner where you go immediately to 100% risk picked up by the government, we go there as a last resort because we believe that if the plans that are administering the program share some of the risk, they're going to be more responsible in managing the taxpayer's money. But the difference between the Democrats' plan and the bipartisan plan in making sure that prescription benefit managers are out there offering the program is in the end one-tenth of 1% of the assumption of risk. It is a Medicare program. It is an entitlement under Medicare. We just think that a shared partnership where possible to get people who are going to be delivering benefits, sharing in the risk, is a more responsible way to go than to simply say, do whatever you want and we'll foot the bill. That's the difference, really, well, the, the between general, the, the two plans. The gentlemen and, and members of my party have a difference, a, a fundamental difference. We believe that the Medicare program that's been in existence for the last six, 35 years is one of the best things the federal government has ever done. The gentleman's party would like to privatize Medicare and reverse the last 35 years of history. There is a fundamental difference in the way we, we view the Medicare program and prescription drugs. I would tell the gentleman that he just mentioned that the, the current Medicare program is run by contractors who are private sector folk. Now, you don't call that privatization. Your prescription drug program is run by private contracting with pharmaceutical benefit managers. You don't call that privatization, but when we use the very same pharmaceutical benefit managers with the ultimate difference of one-tenth of one percent in shared risk, ours is privatization. And I will tell you that you simply are trying to sell an empty sack when you argue that Republicans are not in favor of Medicare. We are the ones who put $40 billion on the table to reinvest in Medicare for prescription drugs when you didn't have the press releases talking about all that money that's coming. 
We are the ones who move forward with the modernization of Medicare. The changes made in 1997, and I will say in all honesty, with cooperation with the administration, to make the long overdue changes that need to be made in the program that weren't made under your party's majority so that we could make sure that the longevity of Medicare is guaranteed, but more importantly, that the funding process maximizes the ability of the taxpayers to guarantee that they get something for their taxpayer dollar instead of simply saying, we hope it works. Responsible management is always a better choice, I tell my friend from Texas, than to say that the bureaucrats who haven't been able to even meet a statutory date that they committed to to put these no, new programs into effect are the ones your party has chosen to run this new, difficult, $100 billion program. Well, I'm glad that the gentleman is defending the uh, reforms of 97, which are bankrupting rural hospitals all over this country and destroying home health care in this country. I, th I find that a very interesting... I point. tell the gentleman if we check the voting record, you may have been uh, in support of that as well. And since then, since all of those people and you're now plotting, you're applauding about their ability to predict how much money we're going to get were the ones who made the mistakes on the projections. There's no sense in pointing a finger of blame at this point. What we need to do, as we did last year in the Balanced Budget Refinement Act of 1999, is take what money we have available, work together in a bipartisan way, invest that money where it will do the kind of good that we all want to do, but to use the rhetoric that the gentleman is using rather than to address policy and try to make the changes that we all know need to be made simply prolongs the agony of the seniors out there who want relief. I want to work immediately, as we did last year with the administration and with any Democrat who wants to work with us, to invest that money so that seniors have their needs met. Rhetoric is old-fashioned. Politics is old-fashioned. Policy within the money we have available today is what we ought to be doing. Well, there's obviously a different view of the world. And well, I'm I agree. You like the rhetoric and politics. The gentleman, we like the gentleman policy. is an articulate spokesman for his view of the world. I just believe his view of the world is not shared by the majority of the American public. Thank you very much, Mr. Frost. Mrs. Slaughter. Mr. Thomas, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for your uh, very thoughtful and interesting uh, arguments. And we look forward to taking your recommendations into consideration as we proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Our next witness is a gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cardin. And uh, looks as if you have prepared remarks, and they will, uh, without objection, appear. Thank you, in Mr. The record, Chairman. And we'd uh, welcome a summary from you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I'm not going to get into a lengthy debate over the Democratic uh, substitute that we asked to be made in order. But I thought the debate was rather interesting, and I would hope we could have that debate on the floor. And it seems to me the way to have that debate on the floor is to let the Democratic substitute be made in order. But I'm here to ask that you allow an amendment uh, to the bill to be made in order. This amendment will not add any additional cost to the program. So uh, using Mr. Thomas's criteria, I think this is an appropriate amendment. But I think it really will allow us to debate on the floor the central difference between what some of us have been articulating, our concerns with the bill that was reported out of the committee. And let me try to explain that. Under the bill that was reported out of the committee, you could offer a prescription drug in one of three different ways. You could have a private prescription drug plan that would be offered by a company that comes into our community to offer just a prescription drug plan. Secondly, you could get your prescription drug coverage through an HMO, Medicare Plus Choice, which is the current way in which many of our seniors are getting their prescription drugs met if there is an HMO under Medicare Plus Choice. And the third way under the reported bill that you could get your prescription drug would be under an employer-sponsored plan. There are the three options that are available. There's got to be two plans in your district. My amendment is very simple. It says offer a fourth option to our constituents, and that is a government-sponsored plan. That would make this a, 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 a covered service under Medicare. If my amendment is not adopted, you cannot go back to your constituents and tell them with any degree of certainty that they will be offered a prescription drug plan in their community that will provide a $250 deductible and a 50% copayment up to the $1,000 and a catastrophic above $6,000.
You can't tell them that because it's not in the bill. You don't know what's going to be offered. It may well be a plan that has a higher deductible or lower limits. We don't know. But if we adopt the Cardin Amendment, then you know that the defined benefit, that is that the standard benefit that is spelled out in the bill will be offered in our community. It will offer more competition rather than less competition. For the life of me, I don't understand the reason why you would deny this amendment being offered. It also addresses the concerns of HMOs continuing to flight our community. In 1997, I had eight HMOs in my state. I'm down to four. There will be no more than three after January the 1st, and there may be zero. And I'm talking about a rural state, not an urban state. Uh, not I'm talking about an urban. I'm talking about an urban state, not a rural state. I mean, Baltimore is not exactly what you would call a rural community, and it's possible in my district we're not going to have HMOs writing for our seniors. So only if we guarantee that there will be a program. Now, I admit, Mr. Chairman, I, I use a, uh, a prescription benefit manager. I think that's sound practice to use a prescription benefit manager. That's permitted under this amendment to be used by the government-sponsored plan. But I don't know why we would deny a government-sponsored plan. We allow every other Medicare service to be provided by a government-sponsored plan. Why would we tell our seniors they can't have prescription drug? It provides for more competition rather than less. And I would urge you to make uh, this amendment in order. It also provides stability. It's one thing to say that a private plan will be there today. We don't know whether it will be there tomorrow. We've seen many plans leave communities. You, you could very well find that a prescription drug uh, plan might be offered in one part of your county, not another under this, under this, uh, the bill as reported. Under my amendment, you're guaranteed to know that year in, year out, there will be these benefits that will be offered to your, uh, to your constituents at no additional cost. And I urge uh, you to make this amendment in order. It will cost nothing. This will not, actually, it may reduce costs slightly because of more competition, but it doesn't change any of the underlying provisions in the reported bill, so it will not cost any additional money than the $40 billion that's already in the bill. I vote for it. Thank you. Appreciate it. I got one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is a gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Tanner. Uh, apparently he's not here. We'll now uh, proceed to uh, members of the Committee on Commerce, and we're happy to first uh, recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Burr, and we're happy to uh, have you here and look forward to your testimony. And without objection, any prepared statement you have will appear in the record, and we'd love to have a summary. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, members of the Rules Committee. I don't have a prepared statement. I'll make some brief remarks if I can. I'm here on behalf of Chairman Bliley and the majority of the members, uh, the majority members of the Commerce Committee, uh, in support of H.R. Uh, 4680. Um, Thomas Jefferson said, "I'm not an advocate of frequent changes in laws and constitutions, but laws and institutions must advance to keep pace with the progress of the human mind." I think, in fact, uh, that was a message to the American people, but it was also a message to this institution that we're constantly challenged to protect the Constitution, but this institution must realize the changes in technology, in society, and in Medicare and medicine. And in fact, were we to create Medicare today, it would probably look somewhat different than it does if I had a hand in it. But it would have a prescription drug element to it because prescription drugs are so much a part of the treatment. We believe so much a part that it will actually be a savings in the future to Part A and Part B, the hospitalization and the outpatient and physician use of medicine for seniors, uh, that this is a compelling reason that we should begin to incorporate prescription drug benefits into the Medicare system. This is an entitlement. It is part of Medicare. But it, it does use a lot of the recommendations of, uh, of uh, the Medicare Commission and others who have looked at innovative ways to try to structure health care for the future to meet not only the challenge of the financial burdens that will be placed on it, but also to meet the test of a doubling of the population of beneficiaries of both seniors and disabled who qualify for Medicare. There are two stark differences 
between the 40, 46, uh, 80, and what we think, or I think, the Democrat substitute would look like. We choose to create the Medicare Benefit Administrator, or administration, to administer and to negotiate the drug benefit with private entities, entities that would include insurers but would also be made up of other entities in the marketplace. The substitute chooses HICFA, the Healthcare Financing Administration, to administer the drug benefit. And it's just this year that, in a bipartisan way, we've struggled with the Healthcare Financing Administration because of their decisions as it related, related to self-injectable drugs. Drugs that up till the point that technology would allow them to be self-administered at home, self-injected, HICFA paid for when they were in outpatient settings or in doctor's offices. As soon as those same drugs became self-injectable, HICFA determined that seniors could no longer be reimbursed for their drug use because of the method, not because of the medicine. We think it's time to shift that responsibility to an agency whose sole focus it is to determine how to administer a drug benefit to seniors, to incorporate what technology, the advances that technology is allowed to take place, and to make sure and I think I'm answering uh, Mr. Sessions' question, to make sure that the benefit is always up to date on the latest therapies that are available, if in fact those are appropriate for seniors to use. The second place that there would be significant difference between 4680 and the proposed substitute would be in the word choice. We believe that seniors deserve to have more choices than one. The president's plan, the substitute plan, would choose to create regional PBMs, and there would be one. And those seniors in that particular region would choose from that one plan, a one-size-fits-all program. Uh, we believe, and we have incorporated in 4680, a mandate that requires the Medicare Benefit Administrator to have two or more choices for seniors. That could be two or more insurers. It could be one insurer and a drug association who had banded together to offer a plan it could be the AARP, who is the largest mail order source of pharmaceuticals in America today, and I might also say the largest seller of Medigap policies of insurance today in this country. It could be entities that none of us have currently thought about that are created through this bill stimulating um, uh, interest in the marketplace. Mr. Chairman, I should be here thanking the Rules Committee for their vigilance in protecting budget resolutions for the last six years because it's because of you uh, that we have what the White House has projected to be an over $200 billion uh, surplus. I, I, like Mr. Thomas, am interested in looking at making investments in those things where we know we have, as a Congress, guessed wrong. But now is not the time. Now is the time to debate a drug benefit for seniors, to design a benefit that has three separate tests that must pass. One, the test of time. 20 years from now, will we look back at what we did in this Congress, and will the structure still be there because the design of the plan was right? I believe in 4680 that will be true. Two, the financial requirements that we know drugs will have 20 years from now. I believe that the process that CBO has sent us through in scoring 4680 have been the most stringent I've seen since I've been in this institution. I believe that the numbers are, in fact, accurate, and I think they inflect the inflation rate of drugs over 15% in the first three years, and not what uh, others have used, which is more the inflation rate in our economy. The third one and the single most important, Mr. Chairman, is the test of weight. We know that uh, the senior population will double over the next 15 to 20 years, that we will move from 35 million beneficiaries to 70 million beneficiaries. The weight of what we design uh, will be tested as those seniors hit this system. I'm hopeful that uh, the Rules Committee will see fit uh, to uh, let a substitute, if it lives within the $40 billion, be offered. 
that it would limit amendments that cost additional monies to protect the integrity of the $40 billion, and that uh, the Rules Committee would see that we have reached a very delicate uh, legislative bill. Even Mr. Cardin, uh, I think, even though he said uh, that his change would not cost, I believe that if you took that change to the Congressional Budget Office and asked them to score it, that in fact you would find that the Congressional Budget Office says when you bring structure versus the flexibility needed in the marketplace to present a benefit to seniors, it costs more. And in fact, I believe his benefit would score, though I'm not prepared today to tell you how much. I, uh, I applaud the committee for uh, uh, listening to uh, a very lengthy uh, debate on the rule for this drug benefit, well, and I look forward much, to it. Thank you Mr. Burr. We appreciate your being here, and thanks for your uh, very thoughtful remarks. Mr. Goss? Well said. Well I commend you for your patience. Uh, I mean, we have to be here. I mean, <laughs> Well, considering you and I flew in at about the same time and you offered me a ride, I should have took you up on it because I waited 20 more minutes. <laughs> okay. uh, did I understand you to say that you represent Chairman Bliley? That's correct, Re Chairman Bliley and the majority of uh, the majority party of the Commerce Committee. Well, I know this bill was referred to you, but did you act upon it in the committee at all? Uh, I'm a member of the committee. I'm a co-sponsor of 4680. No, but I mean... Did you act, did the committee act on this? The committee did not mark up 4680. The committee has had, as recently as two weeks ago, hearings uh, that incorporated all of the drug bills that were offered and any suggestions and options that existed in the marketplace. So you're not representing the committee as such then before this? Uh, Chairman Bliley and the majority of the Republican members. On the committee? Yes, sir. But not with a bill that has been marked up. You're exactly right, sir. Well, you didn't, did you take it up before on the committee? No, sir, we, we did not take well, it up. Well, how do you know you represent the majority of the Republicans? Um, do you have a Ouija board or something? Um, no, sir, I don't, but, uh, but clearly I'm confident that uh, oh, any, con that are not in, uh, any that are not in agreement would come in and share that to the Rules Committee. Well, I appreciate your confidence, but we'd like a little more evidence. You know. All right, thank you. You're more than welcome. Mr. Slender. Mr. Price. Mrs. Myrick. Mr. Sessions, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Burr, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your testimony. <clears throat> I see that Mr. Tanner has uh, returned, and we're happy to call on him uh, at this point. And uh, if you have prepared remarks, they will uh, appear in the record without objection. And forward your testimony. Thank you. It's a very straightforward amendment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you and the committee again for your time. It just says that any pharmacist in any given area who agrees to whatever plans negotiated by the HMO under the bill as uh, as written uh, would be uh, would not be excluded and would be allowed to participate. Very much. I have no question, Mr. Goss. No. Mr. Moakley. Mr. Mr. Linder. Sounds good, big job. Mr. Price. Mrs. Myrick, Mr. Sessions, Mr. Reynolds, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for coming thank back. Thank you. Very efficient. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. We occasionally get a little help from our witnesses, too. Uh, next, uh, we're happy to uh, welcome the distinguished gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Gansky. And uh, happy to have you. And uh, your remarks, if they are prepared, will appear without objection uh, in the record. And we'd welcome a summary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and uh, I am a, a Republican member of the Commerce uh, Committee. We did not hold a markup on this bill. I do have some serious reservations about the Republican bill, but in a bipartisan fashion, I have some serious reservations about the Democratic bill, too, and I'll go into that for a minute. I'm going to ask you to, uh, to uh, make an order uh, a substitute. Uh, H.R. 4743, this is the Drug Availability and Health Care Access Improvement Act uh, that I have uh, introduced. And the reason that I would like you to make this in order is that this bill, I think, could become law. I think today 
you've certainly seen in the Rules Committee a, a, a partisan bickering uh, going on. I think it's unlikely that we're going to see a prescription drug bill signed into law this year. There is, though, some agreement between the Democratic bills and the Republican bill, and I'll talk about that one uh, area of agreement. But I would like to say, you know, that the high cost of prescription drugs is not just a, co a problem for seniors. It's also a problem for everyone else in this country, and we ought to look at addressing that issue. And that's why I'm sorry that we did not get a chance to do that in the other committee of jurisdiction, the Commerce Committee. So what I would like to do is just briefly describe what's in my bill and note that I'm also introducing or asking you to make an order four separate amendments that are taken from this bill in the event that you do not make the substitute uh, in order. I want to go to Mr. Linder's uh, uh, state question earlier, and that was, what is the average cost for beneficiaries, Medicare beneficiaries? 14% of Medicare beneficiaries spend nothing on prescription drugs. 36% of Medicare beneficiaries spend less than $500 on prescription drugs a year. Another 16, another 19% spend less than $1,000 a year. So 69% of Medicare beneficiaries spend less than $1,000 on drugs a year. Now I want to take you back to 1988. Some of you were here, I wasn't, but I watched this process when Congress passed, this House passed a catastrophic health care bill, the biggest expansion in Medicare benefits in history, by about uh, 365 votes, I think the House passed it. Ronald Reagan enthusiastically signed that into law. And then the senior citizens started to look at the bill. And this, in my opinion, is the fundamental defect of both the Republican and the Democratic bills. In 1988, it was a mandatory benefit, but mandatory premiums. And so Chairman Rostenkowski devised a bill that spread the insurance risk. Everyone had to participate. But because everyone participated, the premiums could be kept down. But it was also the insurance principle that you pay something now to get a benefit later. What happened? Well, the Grey Panthers started to pound, jump up and down on Dan Rosenkowski's car because a lot of seniors found that those premium increases were more than what they were paying currently for, a drug, for drug costs. Now look at the way the Republican bill is, is designed. You have about a $40 a month premium. You have a $250 deductible. So let's just say you have $500 of premiums, $250 deductible. For that, you get a 50 cent on the dollar benefit up to $2,100. Basically, Mr. Stark was right. Before you, a beneficiary will start to see a benefit from voluntarily participating in the plan, they will have to have out-of-pocket expenses in excess of $1,000. So a large number of seniors are going to say, I don't have very much in drug expenses now. I'm not going to join this. But both the administration plan and the GOP plan is premised on at least 80% benefic 80 participation in order to have those premiums where they're at. I think it's highly unlikely that if this would become law or even the president's plan would become law that you would see that type of voluntary participation. Consequently, the premiums will go up. Now, the Republicans talk, try to address this adverse risk problem in their bill by saying, if you don't sign up initially, then when you sign up subsequently, your premiums could be higher. But I would say that won't make much of a difference because that's exactly what the current Medicare plan is. Out of the 10 Medigap policies, H, I, and J offer a prescription drug benefit. But only people who have high prescription drugs sign up for those plans. Consequently, the premiums are very high. Only 7% of Medicare beneficiaries sign up for the drug Medigap policies now. And so I think it's unlikely that Congress is, is, is going to pass a law that makes it mandatory in light of what happened in 1988. And so what's the alternative? 
While the alternative in both the president's plan and in the Republican plan is to address the issue of those senior citizens who do not qualify for Medicaid drug benefit, but are just above it. And so my proposal in essence says, bring on board for those state Medicaid drug plans, those who have incomes up to 175% of poverty. It could be implemented tomorrow. The state Medicaid drug plans have already achieved discounts with the pharmaceutical companies. And this takes care of the elderly widow who is just barely making it on her social security check, who is having to make choices between her rent, her food, and her drugs. Then what we ought to do is we ought to address the high prices of drugs for everyone, including the other seniors, but for the non-seniors as well. And I have some proposals for that. Number one, we should increase the floor for the annual adjusted per capita cost in Medicare to $600. That's for those rural areas. Number two, we should put in this bill 100% deductibility for the self-insured. We know how much that costs because we had that in the minimum wage bill. Number three, we ought to get the, those people who qualify for Medicaid and for the CHIP program into those programs. They have a drug benefit. That would take care of a lot of those who are uninsured. Gil Gutnick, my colleague, is going to talk about getting the Food and Drug Administration off seniors and others' backs when they try to re-import drugs from other countries at a, at a discount. That would bring some competition in. I'll let him talk more about that later. That's not one of my amendments one of my separate amendments. We all know that, that uh, pharmaceutical companies are advertising very heavily. The average senior citizen sees eight prescription drug ads a day on TV. At the minimum, we ought to require those drug companies to spend more time on discussing the contraindications and the possible complications of those drugs. And that would at least, I think, put some uh, uh, information uh, into senior citizens. And finally, I think that the, uh, Congressman Coburn is right, and we ought, Congress ought to, ought to at least do a sense of Congress uh, on whether drug companies have been colluding in price. And we ought to uh, look more carefully at drug company mergers and the effect that that is having on, on uh, price. And so I have to substitute, I have a separate amendment just on the Medicaid prescription drug coverage for low income, a separate amendment on raising the floor for MediChoice, Medigap Choice, uh, Medicare Plus Choice, a separate amendment on increased consumer information and prescription drug coverage, and finally a separate amendment on the sense of Congress regarding manufacturer pricing practices. And I'd be happy to take any questions. And if uh, any of you want more information, I gave a uh, special orders the other night on this, and I'd be happy to share that. Thank you, Dr. Ansk. I, um, I think it's clear. The only point is, let me ask this, is your substitute uh, embody as well all of the additional amendments or, or the uh, amendments that you are asking for other than your substitute directed to the bill as it's presently presented by Ways and Means? Uh, the, the other amendments are directed to the Ways and Means Base bill. Base bill, okay. But, Thank you. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at the substitute. I just wondered, does the substitute include all the additional provisions of those amendments to the original Ways and Means Bill? Thank you. Uh, no, I enjoyed your, your, your talk. But when you're talking about the pharmaceuticals advertising on TV, <laughs> I think they give more reasons not to take the pill. You know, they, you know, if you take a walk around the block, your left leg may be still in the chair or something. Uh, you know, if you have a kidney problem, if you have high blood pressure, if you, you may be nauseous. I mean, everyone I saw, I wouldn't touch the drug after listening to the commercials. I, I mean, uh, I know that they have to talk about <clears throat> the possible of side effects, but I just think that some of them just go too far. So I, I don't think they're, they're really doing their products any good the way they advertise them, some of the commercials I've seen anyway. I'd like you to. I've been watching a lot of these commercials. The typical one is Viagra. You know, it shows an elderly a couple dancing in the moonlight with sort of a blue Viagra haze. And um, 
right at the end of the commercial is just uh, about two seconds worth of potential complications, which could be life-threatening. And I think uh, uh, everyone, not just seniors, deserves more information. And not necessarily a laundry list, but let's say the two or three most problematic problems related to those new medications, which are wonderful. Many of those new drugs are great. But in the interest of, yeah. it, it may actually reduce the, um, the uh, demand for some very expensive drugs. Well, uh, you're a doctor, I'm sure. Uh, they tell me that Viagra started out as a heart pill, so if people are on a certain heart medicine that have some of the basic qualities, that per just taking the, the pill could kill them. Is that so? Uh, if a person is a, has a heart condition and is taking nitrates, uh, Viagra could be lethal. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Linder. Um, I think the crux of what you're saying is that 69% of the people would not have a benefit under this program, under either program, and I, that it's going to be that it's going to result in the same thing that a community rating does. I think you would see that uh, close to above 60 percent would look at what their costs of participating in the program would be compared to what their current benefits would be, and they'd say the program costs more than what my benefits would be. Therefore, I'll wait until sometime in the future when I have more drug costs before I decide to join which is just what they do under the current voluntary Medicare program now. So the amortization that one would expect from 80% participation where the low users or subsidized and high users will not be there. That's right. Um, thank you. You might not want to read some of the labels of some of the packaged food that comes around these days either. Miss Myrick, Mr. Reynolds, thank you very thank much, Dr. Gansky. Thank you we very much. We go now to the Honorable Frank Pallone of New Jersey, who has waited patiently. Mr. Pallone, we, uh, the remarks you have without objection be included in the record, and uh, any uh, other observations about any amendments or other thoughts would be welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. And I, I do have a written statement which I'll submit, uh, but I'm just going to try to summarize it because Please I think you've probably heard a lot of what I've said already from other Democratic colleagues. Basically, my request is that the committee make a Democratic substitute uh, in order that's consistent with the President's proposal and the bill that was offered uh, by the Ways and Means Minority members in that committee uh, during last week's uh, markup. Uh, and the reason I say this is because these bills are such, uh, so drastically different. Uh, if I had to compare, you know, the Republican bill that came out of Ways and Means compared to the Democratic substitute, I think they're so different that there really begs for an opportunity for us to consider uh, both options uh, on the floor of the House. Uh, without going into s too much in terms of specifics, I think that the dramatic difference is that the Democratic substitute uh, basically uh, provides for expansion of Medicare, a Medicare benefit, a new Part D benefit, if you will, uh, and that uh, essentially uh, it says that if you, if you pay the premium uh, pursuant to Medicare, you will get a defined benefit that's universal, that's voluntary, and that starts in 2003. Uh, it has a $4,000 cap on out-of-pocket costs, and after that, of course, the catastrophic benefit kicks in. It has the uh, relief for rural HMOs. It also has the larger package of the BBA refinements. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the majority, the Republican bill, it's va basically a, a very different approach that relies uh, primarily on uh, insurance policies, subsidizing, if you will, uh, insurance uh, policies outside of Medicare's umbrella. That in itself seems to me enough uh, that we should have the Democratic option out there so that people, uh, our, our colleagues can choose on the floor and the American people can see the distinction. Under the uh, Republican approach, the benefits package is not defined. Um, the, the threshold for covering catastrophic is different is $6,000, which I think is too high. There's also no uh, mechanism for bringing the cost of drugs down for seniors in the Republican proposal. Now, I, I have to say, and I'm sure you've heard, that the Democratic substitute uh, costs about $100 billion over, over five years. This is what the President said 
over the weekend in, in uh, urging support for this substitute. Um, I know it does not fit within the Republican budget plan, which is only $40 billion, but I would say that that shouldn't matter because we're expecting a much larger budget surplus than was originally anticipated. And I think we can provide a much more generous benefit than the $40 billion in the Republican budget would finance. I think really ultimately it's, a it's not a question of resources. The resources are there. It's a question of priorities. And I would urge that uh, you consider uh, the Democratic substitute for all those reasons, but primarily because there is such a distinction here. And I think when that distinction is there and we have such very different proposals, it's incumbent on, on the committee to allow uh, both proposals to come to the floor and be debated uh, in, in, in the normal fashion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Much of uh, your statement uh, seems to reflect uh, the same views as uh, Mr. Stark, and I think we've heard those considerably well. Right. Mr. Linder? Mr. Price? Mr. Brown? Thank you Thank very you. much. For such comments as you wish to make, any prepared statements will be accepted for the record without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start out by asking unanimous consent to make one comment on the Energy and Water Appropriations Bill. Uh, I think that, yes, that here is solved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I understand that there was a request to, uh, to not protect any of the authorizing language in the Appropriations Bill, and I'd ask the committee to make at, at least one exception. I'm sure you'll be asked through the night to make some others. Uh, but it has to do with a project that was authorized in fiscal 2000. It's the third year of a water feasibility study, a very small amount of money in the Rio Grande Valley in New Mexico. We have asked Mr. Doolittle to do the same authorization language for fiscal year 2001 uh, and have made that request in, in writing to him. Uh, but we'd ask that you waive the point of order on this particular language, and I will give it to the staff so that they know exactly what I will uh, have those uh, comments uh, re reflected in the hearing at the appropriate time when we go back into that hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, we're, we're still on the uh, Medicare uh, RX 2000 bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, am very glad that we're now uh, uh, looking at the Medicare the prescription drug problem for seniors. It's a very serious problem that I hear a great deal about from folks in my district. There is one amendment that I would like to uh, the committee to, uh, to uh, uh, allow to be offered on the floor, and it has to do with the Medicare plus choice part of the bill in Title III. There are a number of states who are paid for Medicare plus choice at a rate that's far, far below the national average. In New Mexico, uh, most of my counties in New Mexico are, are reimbursed at $370 per member per month. In Albuquerque, which is our major metropolitan area, is $430 per member per month. The reason that it's that low compared to Staten Island at $811 a month and, and parts of Florida at $760 per month is because when, at the time the formula was set, there were a lot of folks in New Mexico, it was based on two things. One was cost and the other was utilization rates. New Mexico had managed care far, below, far before many other places in the country. We had one of the first HMOs in the nation, Loveless Hospital. And so costs had been brought down in advance of Medicare Plus Choice coming in, be, becoming a reality. The second reason is that we have a very poor and generally underinsured population, so utilization rates are low. People don't go to the hospital or to go see the doctor, uh, sometimes even when they should. In New Mexico, over half of our seniors are covered by Medicare Plus Choice. Managed care is the preferred option for a lot of people, and we have many good Medicare and managed care uh, companies in New Mexico. Mr. Stark said that he didn't think that anyone in this room had a managed care company for their health care. Well, I do, under the Federal Employee Benefits Program. And 40,000 seniors in my district are covered by Medicare Plus Choice. Uh, and I, I have managed care for my family because it's the best option. And it's the preferable one for me and for my family and for many seniors. The problem is that every HMO in the state of New Mexico lost money last year. Presbyterian Hospital lost $26 million last year. And they're on slope to be, continue to lose money. And it's primarily because of low reimbursement rates. In Title III of this bill, there is a partial remedy to this situation. It doesn't change the reimbursement rates as such. 
what it does is says that if you are below average in Medicare plus choice, then that price that's set is a reference price. And you, county by county, have the right to go to this benefits administration and negotiate a higher rate based on cost. If you can show that your costs are higher to provide the care, you can negotiate a higher rate. It was, uh, I had several discussions with, with Chairman Thomas in the months leading up to this draft bill coming out about how important that is to states like New Mexico and seven others that are currently suing the federal government for discriminatory treatment under this program. But I don't think we can wait until 2004, the date in the draft bill, uh, to have some kind of relief in that regard. So the, men the amendment that I'm offering would give managed care companies the right to negotiate a higher rate based on cost and stay in the managed care business, stay in Medicare plus choice, effective in 2001. So all it does is accelerate from 2004 to 2001, the date at which managed care companies could negotiate a higher rate based on cost. The alternative is that a lot of more managed care companies are going to pull out of Medicare Plus Choice. They've already started. Cigna has announced uh, its first wave of communities it's pulling out of. There are more on the way. Those folks will try to go into the regular fee-for-service Medicare, and, and, and Medicare still has to cover them. That, of course, is higher and doesn't have the competitive cost controls in it that, uh, that Medicare Plus Choice has. But in Albuquerque, the largest uh, largest company to cover Medicare Plus Choice is, is the Loveless HMO, and they aren't fee-for-service. And so 20,000 people in Albuquerque will be thrown onto the Medicare, regular Medicare fee-for-service system, have to change their physician and change their medical plan, and I frankly don't even think that the system will be able to absorb that much if some of these managed care companies pull out, because managed care is such a preference for people in New Mexico. So I'm asking for some immediate relief and that this amendment be made in order. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. We appreciate your testimony. Mr. Goss? Not at all. I barely understand what you're talking about. Mr. Linder? Do you have any uh, indi indication as to whether this is a money saver or a cost? Mr. Chairman, we, uh, Mr. Ryan is also uh, offering this amendment with me, um, although he had to leave to see some constituents. He had initial discussions with CBO, and their initial, their, his initial discussion was that it would be, there, there would be no increased cost. They later withdrew that and said they weren't sure. Um, I talked directly to the analyst, and they said they would not be able to give an estimate, uh, which was is, you know, a little frustrating. Uh, and, and I understand that they've got a number of factors that play in there, how many pull out, how many go over to fee-for-service, how many would be able to negotiate a higher reimbursement rate and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, we, so we don't really have an answer from CBO. Ms. Price, Mrs. Myrick, Mr. Reynolds, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next witness is the gentleman from uh, Missouri, Ms. Emerson, and appears she'll be joined by the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Berry. Please come forward, and we welcome your testimony. And uh, if you have prepared remarks, they will, without objection, appear in the record in their entirety. So please proceed as you see fit. Ms. Emerson. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I, my colleague, Marion Berry, and I have worked together with Congressman Bernie Sanders on an issue that we think is very, very critical in the whole discussion of prescription drugs. And that has to do with the extraordinarily high prices that drug manufacturers are charging for their medicines. And coming from a rural district like I do, like Marion does, uh, this is something that is perhaps harder for some people to understand because we have very little, if any, competition in rural America. And I, I feel very strongly that it isn't fair that we fund the research, uh, we give tax breaks, and Still, our citizens pay a lot more than those in any other country anywhere in the world. And as we go forward with some kind of prescription drug bill for our senior citizens, I, I think it's just extraordinarily important that we deal with the whole issue of prices and the impact that that will have on the entire 
prescription drug package that inevitably comes up or comes out of this uh, Congress. Our, our amendment, which is very similar to the International Prescription Drug Parity Act, I know which has um, nearly 100 co-sponsors, would amend the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to allow American distributors, wholesalers and distributors, and pharmacists to re-import prescription drugs into the United States. If you may, right now, current law allows pharmacists as well as wholesaler distributors to, to distribute drugs <coughs> nationwide. And this simply would allow them in, to re-import them back into the United States where the same drugs are sold for anywhere from a quarter to a third to, a, to half of what we pay here in the United States. They'd be required to meet the same strict safety standards that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration sets forward for our domestic drugs. But it seems to me and to, to my colleagues and others that if more than just a small handful of organizations or companies are able to re-import these drugs and are able to pass around to senior citizens a lower cost, that that's what we ought to be looking at. And so I feel very strongly that it's important to do this. I would hope that the committee would allow this amendment to become part of the debate when we deal with the whole prescription drug issue. Because quite frankly, y'all, I don't think that with, unless we can deal with the issue of prices, I'm not sure we can get a real handle on how much this bill's gonna cost us. I mean, we say it's gonna cost $38.6 billion, but if we don't address the pricing issue up front, then I don't know how much it's gonna cost. And with that, I'll stop and allow my colleague to speak. Well, I would associate myself with the remarks uh, of my colleague, Mrs. Emerson from Missouri, and appreciate her leadership in this matter, and will only uh, uh, reiterate that it just simply is not fair that the American people pay more for their prescription medicine than any other nation in the world. We do most of the research and development here, and at the same time, our people are overcharged by at least 30%, no matter what the product is, or no matter what country we compare it to. This will help reduce the cost of any prescription drug benefit that we provide for our senior citizens, and it will also give the American people, all of the American people, an even break as far as how much they have to spend on prescription medicine. So I would also ask the committee to waive the rules and allow this amendment to be uh, voted on. Thank you very much. You presented a case very well for somebody who got here. Didn't expect to be here. Do you have any questions? Here. Well, we'll I'll find out in just a minute. Judge Price, do we have any questions? I don't have any questions. I have listened to this argument um, a lot over the last few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Meyer. No, actually, you presented it well enough, and we've got a very good cheat sheet up here, so that I think we got the point pretty quickly. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman, because, you know, it's, it's so hard, it, it, particularly in my district, where, you know, we're very lucky if we, we get discounts at all, and most people, anyway, are very lucky if they get discounts, that when you present to them the whole issue of the reimportation, they're shocked that it's not possible for us to get that savings that people in other countries get. And, and because it's, it's critical that, that we deal not only with the cost that they pay, but really with the overall pricing mechanism, I, I, I just think that this is something that's important. And I would ask the committee to ver give very serious consideration to, to adding this to the, to the entire uh, debate. I've got to admit, I was a little startled to hear you say there's not much competition in rural areas. I, uh, I think there's a lot of competition, but in a different form. I don't quarrel with you. It's just the survival is uh, competition these days in the farmlands. It, it, it is uh, survival uh, is uh, very much on everybody's minds in rural America, where we're you know we have lower uh, reimbursements for Medicare costs, but it costs the same to do something, uh, you know, a mammogram and. In Cape Girardeau, as it does in St. Louis or in uh, in Helena, Arkansas, and uh, transportation and education and, and 
you know, I'm just very concerned that in the whole issue of the prescription drugs that our seniors in rural America still will not be given uh, prices at the same level as, as you get in the cities. You represent them well. Thank you very much, good panel. At this time, uh, I understand uh, Mr. Gephardt's not coming in. Okay, uh, since I do not see the Honorable um, Minority Leader, and I do not see Mr. Capuano from Massachusetts, I do see Mr. Allen from Maine. We welcome you to the table. And, and Mr. Ms. Reagan is going to be assisted by the great state of Rhode Island. And Mr. Reagan and Mr. Allen. Would press the button. It would assist the vast viewing audience. Great. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank you for the opportunity to testify before this uh, distinguished committee on this particular issue. Uh, I, I am here to offer an amendment with uh, Mr. Wagan, uh, Karen Thurman, Marion Berry, and Jan Schakowsky. And basically, what I thought I would do is describe a little bit about what that amendment would do. Uh, basically, uh, what it would do is, th is this. Under the Republican plan, under H.R. 4680, as it's coming out, there is really no way to contain costs. And what my amendment would do is provide that the PDP sponsor of a prescription drug plan uh, would have to require, would have to obtain from participating manufacturers and make available to the beneficiary price discounts for prescription drugs at the lower of the following prices. One, the lowest negotiated price for the covered prescription drug by any agency or department of the United States. Or two, the manufacturer's best price as defined uh, in the uh, Medicaid program. The lowest negotiated price for the covered prescription drug by any agency or department of the United States refers to the, it's usually the VA price. Uh, though sometimes it can be a Department of Defense or an Indian health care or a public uh, health service price. Basically, by statute, that is 24% off the average manufacturer's price. Given all the debates we've had about pricing in this Congress, I would remind uh, the members of this committee that the average manufacturer's price is a market price. That is, it is a market price. It is a, dis it is a price which the pharmaceutical industry has more influence over than any other uh, entity. By the same token, the Medicaid price is 15% off the average manufacturer's price, a market price, or the best price available in the, in the private sector. The way our laws are, are, uh, are, are uh, developed in this area uh, is, is that mechanism. Basically, find the best price in the, in the private sector and try to match it with, government, with uh, negotiations through the government agency. Now, over two years ago, I asked the uh, Democratic staff on the Government Reform Committee to come into my district in Maine and to do a, uh, an analysis of the prices paid by seniors. And that study, released in July of 1998 and since replicated all across this country, showed that on average seniors pay twice as much for their prescription me medicines as the drug company's best customers, the HMOs, the big hospitals, and the federal government itself. In October of 1998, we did the first international comparison, which found that people in Maine pay 72% more than Canadians, 102% more than Mexicans for the same drug in the same quantity from the same manufacturer. We cannot deal with this problem either on behalf of our seniors or on behalf of our taxpayers without confronting the issue of price. And it, is, it seems clear to me that the Republican proposal, H.R. 4680, simply does not protect seniors from price discrimination. Uh, the, it provides subsidies on a sliding scale to give seniors the chance to buy private insurance but the premium, the co-pays, and the benefit uh, can change from year to year. There is simply no effective cost control mechanism, so neither seniors nor the taxpayers are protected from uh, price discrimination. In short, it's not a Medicare benefit. It's a new Medigap insurance uh, proposal. And uh, Mr. Chairman, in, in the state of Maine, Medicare plus choice 
we have one provider for the whole state of Maine. And as of last week, that one provider had 1,500 people signed up for Medicare managed care. It is not at all clear that after this July 1st, there'll be any managed care under Medicare in the state of Maine. Because these private insurance companies, these HMOs, come and go as they please, depending on whether or not they're making a profit. And what we are saying with this amendment is, if you're going to rely on HMOs and private insurance companies to provide a benefit to our seniors, at least insure, at least insure that our seniors are getting the best possible price. If you don't do that, our seniors will still be gouged, and the taxpayers will be gouged as, uh, as well. I'd uh, ask now Mr. Wagan to comment. Uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee. Um, let me just uh, add a couple other pieces to the puzzle uh, that Tom has just described. There was a third study that we did as well. The third study compared on a national level what you and I and our senior citizens pay for prescription drugs versus our pets. And we found that the very same drug uh, that you, Mr. Chairman, may take for arthritis, uh, that you take that is manufactured by a company, a, a typical manu uh, pharmaceutical company in the United States, with the same FDA requirements, the same milligram size, the same dosage in terms of being a hard pill, not a soft versus a, a hard pill, the same requirements of everything else. One prescription drug, which is for arthritis, costs the average senior in this country $108.62 for a 30-day supply. My black Labrador retriever takes that pill, and he gets it from my veterinarian for $28.42. This very, very same drug. And the reason for it is what Tom had previously described, marketing and where you can make the most money but the most amount of people. All we want the government to do, and particularly with this bill, is to be able to act like a business. If we have professed year after year after year that government has to be more effective and efficient, all we want them to do is to go out there and negotiate in a very competitive business-like fashion the best possible prices for prescription drugs. Our seniors deserve no less than that. In Rhode Island, we have a system that is for Medicaid recipients. It's called RIPAY. We put it into place many years ago when I was in the General Assembly. And what it does is nothing more than what is part of this proposed amendment. What we do is we go out there as part of the Medicaid system and for all of our seniors within a particular income level. They can receive their prescription drugs either free or for a small amount of money. And we get a rebate from the prescription drug wholesalers, the manufacturers, the Mercs, the Pfizer's, the Glaxo Welcomes, because they negotiate it. It's not price fixing. It's not a mandatory negotiation. But they go out there and they work their magic, as you or I would do in the business world, and get the best possible prices. That's all we're asking for as part of this bill, is give nothing less to our senior citizens that you or I would expect out of a business that we expect out of the other parts of government. And you know, Mr. Chairman, what also happens is the federal government already does this. It already does it as part of the Veterans Administration. For our military across the country, our military retirees receive this be basic benefit of competitive bidding for prescription drugs. We're, not, we're asking for nothing less than that. And quite frankly, it's going to drive down the cost of this program. It can do nothing less. It can't increase it. It can only drive down the cost. If we are to embark upon a prescription drug program in this method, and while we may disagree with the method as being proposed by the Republican leadership, we should at least be assured that the prices are going to be the cheapest possible through fair market negotiations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. You presented very clearly. Uh, questions? Judge Bryce? Uh, no, Ms. Pirate? Mr. Sessions? No questions. Mr. Reynolds? We have uh, two other amendments, if we could take them up at this time, they're very, very quick, Mr. Chairman. They're listed under me as um, Wagon number 57 and Wagon number 56. And the, uh, one of them, number 56, is actually dealing with the same issue. Um, what this would call for is that the PDP sponsor of the prescription drug plan of the Medicare Plus Choice Organization offering such a plan shall assure that a Medicare beneficiary obtaining qualified prescription drug coverage under the plan is eligible to obtain price discounts for prescription drugs in the same manner as military retirees obtain price discounts for prescription drugs under Chapter 55 of Title 10 of the U.S. Code. This, Mr. Chairman, is a bill that many of us, almost all of this entire chamber of the House, 
agreed to as part of the DOD appropriate uh, authorization bill. What we did not too long ago, I think within three weeks ago, this entire chamber agreed that military retirees should receive this kind of benefit. We're asking that that same kind of benefit with that same kind of um, uh, uh, requirement be made for all Medicare beneficiaries under this act. It goes to the same very same question that Tom brought up earlier that we've been fighting for for over two years now is that we need to have in the marketplace a reasonable competitive nature to assure that our seniors get the cheapest prescription drug prices. Now if we can do it for our military retirees, why can't we do it for all our Medicare recipients and beneficiaries? It makes no sense to do otherwise. Yet, I hope you will allow this uh, amendment to be in order because this is nothing more than what, what the entire House, Republicans and Democrats, passed as part of the Department of Defense authorization program just three weeks ago. I ask that for your consideration, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And you have, uh, our, our sheet is numbered a little differently. We're, uh, 18 and 19 are the amendments, but that, that, that's that just for guidance of our members, that's all. And the very last one that I'd like, uh, and I'll get out of the way, this one, Mr. Chairman, is very, very short. Um, this one would simply amend the act. That would say that the um, uh, MBA, the administrator, the Medicare Medi Benefits Administrator, will provide financial, that does provide financial incentives in the area under this paragraph, that the administrator determines that any excessive or unreasonable cost with respect to the amount of the type of incentive provided and the administrative expenses incurred by the administrator in carrying out these negotiations will guarantee access to coverage would be reasonable and not excessive, or that if they are excessive or unreasonable, that they could be denied. There's no language within the bill that does prevent this. This, I would assume, is, is reasonable because we all assume that the administrator is not going to allow excessive or unreasonable cost. But we hope that you would allow for that language to be spelled out. Very clear on both of those. Thank you. Ms. Slaughter, do you have any questions? Any questions please? Ms. Price? Yeah. Ms. Myers? Mr. Sessions? Ms. Reynolds? Thank you. Thank you. Thank Got them all in there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. Uh, the Honorable Gail Goodnick of Minnesota. We welcome you to the committee. Appreciate your patience. If you have prepared remarks for the record, they are accepted for the record without objection. And if you have further comment, we are always happy to receive it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. I do have a, I'd like to have my staff distribute a little brochure, which I uh, did not prepare, but was prepared by the Life Extension Foundation. And on that chart, on the inside page, I'd like to have you take a look at it because I, I find myself attaching myself to the remarks of uh, Dr. Gansky and uh, uh, Representative Emerson and Barry and uh, uh, Allen and uh, Weigan, who have just testified here. A big part of treating any disease is to make an accurate diagnosis. And it seems to me that uh, I'm delighted that we're finally going to take a look at the whole issue of prescription drugs, because it is a serious problem. And it's not just for senior citizens. I have, for example, in, in my district, in the city of Mankato, a couple by the name of De Dave and Emily Butler. Uh, they are not senior citizens, but because of their high cost for prescription drugs, they ultimately had to get a divorce so they could qualify for a program that's made available by the state of Minnesota. They could only do that as singles, and they still love each other, they still live together, but the high cost of prescription drugs. And if you look at this chart, what you see, for example, if you happen to be uh, have a, a, a prescription for uh, Prilosec, for example, and you buy that drug, a 30-day supply in Minneapolis, Minnesota will sell for about $100. If you happen to be vacationing in Winnipeg, Manitoba, you can take that same prescription to a pharmacy in Winnipeg, Manitoba and pay about $50.80. But if you happen to be in Guadalajara, Mexico, you can buy exactly the same drug with exactly the same prescription that has exactly the same FDA approval for $17.50. The chart you see was prepared not by me, but by the Life Extension Foundation, uh, and they compared the prices that Americans pay for very commonly prescribed drugs compared to what Europeans currently pay. And, and, and a couple of them I'd like to point out. One of them is Synthroid. That's a drug that my, my wife takes. Uh, the average price in the United States for a 30-day supply is $13.84. That same drug in Europe sells for $2.95. Coumadin is a drug that my father takes, my 82-year-old father. It's a blood thinner, commonly prescribed for senior citizens. Here in the United States, the average price is over $30. The price in Europe is $2.85. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members of this committee, I think if, if we go about trying to fix, quote, the prescription drug problem without seriously addressing the imbalance between what Americans pay for the same drugs made by the same companies under the same FDA approval, it seems to me we will have made a huge mistake. And, and I realize that it's going to be very difficult to get a bill that can pass the House and pass the Senate, uh, that the Senate and the House can agree and in the conference committee report, and that ultimately the President can sign. To get that all done in the next two months is going to be extremely difficult. But if we could accomplish one thing this year, it seems to me if we could do something to level the, the, the playing field uh, between the prices that Americans pay and that consumers around the rest of the world pay, we would have gone a long ways towards solving this problem. I would like to see us address the problem by beginning to open our borders to allow literally some competition uh, here in the United States. The unvarnished truth is that our own FDA stands between American consumers and lower drug prices. Uh, seniors in the state of Minnesota have been going across the border to bring back, bring back prescription drugs from Canada. And they have supplement, uh, supplemented that by mail ordering from Canadian pharmaceutical supply houses. And when they do this, they get a warning letter from our own FDA saying that these drugs may be illegal. Well, the truth of the matter is these are perfectly legal drugs in the United States. So the amendment that I would like to be, have made in order for this bill uh, simply says that the FDA may not, uh, as long as the drugs are legal drugs in the United States, uh, may not uh, send these threatening letters to anyone who is importing those drugs. Now, this is, a, this is a very small step, but it could have a very profound impact on allowing us to begin to level that playing field between the United States and other parts of the world in terms of what drug companies are charging us. I know that there is embedded in this bill uh, at least the concept of allowing uh, groups to negotiate on behalf of, uh, uh, of seniors, but, but let me just share with you some numbers from one of the largest uh, uh, HMOs in, in Minneapolis, it's Health Partners, George Halverson. They did a study and they believe, now they're already getting negotiated lower prices from the pharmaceutical companies, but their estimates are that if they could set up a relationship with a pharmaceutical supply house in Canada, they could save an addition, if they could recover even half of the savings that they believe are there, they could save on behalf of their subscribers an additional $30 million a year. So Mr. Chairman and members, all I'm really asking for in this amendment is to begin to bring the reins in on our own FDA. If the drugs are illegal, then clearly they should be confiscated at the, at the, at the border and they should not be allowed in the United States. But if they are legal drugs in the United States, if they've been approved and, and, and uh, developed, and manufactured in FDA uh, approved facilities, then the FDA should not intimidate seniors and other consumers. This would begin to level the playing field. We would begin to see the prices uh, uh, level between us and the rest of the United States. I think it's the right thing to do. Seems like a simple enough and sensible enough proposal. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You explained it well. Um, Judge Price? No question. Thank you. Do you have a question? Uh, what do we do? Ms. Slaughter. I, I certainly share with you your concern about the uh, disparity in drug costs in Mexico, Canada, and the United States, all for the same product. Uh, and it's certainly distressed me to see the drug companies putting all those ads on television that some Congress people uh, think that things are better in Canada. And I'm sure you've seen those. Oh, yes. Again, They're running a lot of them in, in my state now. Trying to, to frighten these senior citizens again, and uh, that it is those are uh, put on and paid for by the pharmaceutical company. I think that's that, correct needs to be said. One thing that bothers me is in the present prescription drug bill is before us, since HMOs uh, are dropping senior citizens left and right just off Medicare, do you think that they would want to uh, take on a prescription drug program for a population that they know will be using a lot of medicines? Well, I'm not certain that I'm qualified to answer that question. I mean, but I can talk about the differences between the United States and Canada. And one thing I didn't mention is the Canadian government actually did a study uh, two years ago. We have a copy of which if you'd like it. I'd like and it. their estimates are that Canadians spend 56% less for exactly the same drugs as Americans. And, you know, I think Americans want to pay their fair share of the cost of developing new drugs. I mean, we all take mm -hmm. advantage of that. But the, I think the unvarnished truth is that, that Americans are paying almost the entire freight. We are. I in think. fact, there was a wag that wrote recently in one of the columns that uh, this was really a backdoor way of providing foreign aid to the starving Swiss. <laughs> well, I, I certainly would not like to uh, 
see them continue, uh, what I think are unconscionable profits, uh, and really, as you point out, gouging poor Americans so that, uh, and subsidizing lower prices in other countries. Well, this simple amendment will begin to uh, level that playing field. There's much more that we can do. This is much simpler than the bill that I introduced, but uh, if we could get this made in order, I think we could begin to uh, at least get their attention. Thank you. Ms. Meyer. Mr. Hall. Mr. Sessions. No Mr. Reynolds. Thanks very much, Mr. Goodening. It's very clear what you're saying. Uh, I come now to uh, the Honorable Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin. Welcome. Patiently been sitting there. If you have uh, a prepared statement, it will be accepted without objection for the record. If you have additional comments to your amendment or any other observations, we would be happy to hear them at this time. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here today to request that my amendment to H.R. 4680 be made in order under the rule. As the House considers the very controversial issue of how we go about achieving prescription drug coverage for seniors, my amendment makes a smart, cost-effective change to the way Medicare currently treats self-administered alternatives to physician-administered drugs. Current federal policy requires Medicare to treat drugs that offer identical therapeutic benefits in fundamentally different ways. For drugs injected into a patient by a physician or nurse, Medicare is allowed to pay most of the cost of the drug. But if the drug is taken orally or injected by the patient rather than the physician or nurse, Medicare is prohibited from paying for the drug even if the oral or self-injected version of the drug is equally safe, equally as effective, and less expensive. Congress has previously taken up this issue and made exceptions for a few self-administered drugs on a drug-by-drug -drug basis. My amendment would save Medicare millions of dollars by providing coverage of self-administered drugs that when used in the place of physician-administered alternatives already covered by Medicare result in overall cost savings to the program. A recent report that was prepared at my request found that the legislative prohibition preventing Medicare from covering self-administered prescription drugs for patients undergoing kidney dialysis may be costing the federal taxpayer well over a mil $100 million each year. This alone, um, this year alone, it is estimated that Medicare will pay $167 million for vitamin D hormone injections for hemodialysis patients. If these patients were to use an oral form of that drug instead of one of the injectable drugs, Medicare could save as much as $122 million per year. The amendment would also save patients money. Medicare, as we know, pays for 80% of the cost of vitamin D hormones, requiring patients to pay the remaining 20%. In total, this copayment uh, cost patients approximately $44 million per year for vitamin D hormone treatments. If this oral equivalent were eligible for Medicare reimbursement, these patients could reduce their annual drug expenditures by as much as $35 million per year. I offer this drug, the vitamin D hormone, as an example because this one is self-administered, this has a self-administered equivalent which is known to be equally safe, equally as effective, yet far less expensive. Since I introduced legislation on this issue, I have heard from providers, patients, and drug manufacturers who believe that there may be other replacement drugs that would also qualify. Unfortunately, the federal policy reduces the incentive for pharmaceutical companies to conduct research on self-administered drugs due to the limited market. My amendment would create a market for self-administered drugs and encourage pharmaceutical companies to become more innovative in this area of drug research. This simple change in policy would also increase access to treatment in rural areas, such as in my district. By providing self-administered alternatives, patients would be able to receive treatment in their homes rather than traveling perhaps long distances to clinics, hospitals, or other health facilities. I urge you to make my amendment in order under the rule and allow consideration of this amendment to change this irrational federal policy 
that will result in saving Medicare and patients from unnecessary costs while providing, providing greater access to the treatment that they need. Thank you very much. I apologize. I hadn't seen the pricey of your uh, amendment until just now, uh, which is uh, perhaps you could just help me with one question. I know that in the, um, in, in the bill itself, in uh, 4680 under sections 311 and 12 and so forth, uh, there is treatment of this subject. Right. You've added an additional subject. Uh, what is it that your amendment brings to the bill that's not already there? What's the difference? Section 311 as you identify, make sure that the underlying bill does nothing to disrupt uh, current allowances for self-administered alternatives to physician-administered drugs. The ones that are currently in federal law have been approved literally drug by drug as these issues have arisen. This would permit uh, Medicare, as soon as they find an equally effective um, self-administered alternative that costs less, that would be an automatic approval, rather than having to have Congress consider each drug, each self-administered drug, as it's developed um, in the private sector. I think that this would result in a drastic amount of savings and um, bring common sense, rather than have us look at each uh, uh, treatment for hemodialysis, each uh, in, in multiple sclerosis and chemotherapy and all the other advances we've seen where there are um, now uh, self-administered alternatives to physician-administered drugs. Good. Thank you for the clarification. I see you have the GAO report uh, as well as the GAO report. Thank you. That's helpful. Mr. Hall. Mr. Linder. Judge Price. Myrick, Sessions, Mr. Reynolds, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I too want to uh, identify myself with the remarks of my colleagues. I think that as I sit here and listen to this testimony, I'm quite amazed that we're all coming in with the same concerns, although different uh, suggestions. Uh, what my bill would, would do, uh, actually I'm asking for a waiver to Clause 7 of Rule 16, but Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I am coming before you today to personally ask you to accept my amendment to the Medicare RX Act of 2000. In many respects, this amendment is similar to Senator Gorton's legislation in the other body. Actually, my amendment um, amends the Clayton Act to enforce anti-discrimination trade practices with respect to the sale of international drug sales. Uh, these are the very same principles that have existed in the United States since 1936. People in Canada should not have the ability to, to acquire the same medicine as Americans at substantially lower prices. This is simply inexcusable, I feel, but by applying the same principles of non-discrimination in the pricing of drugs, we will allow the market itself to fairly make prescription drugs available all over the world at more equitable prices. Mr. Chairman, I'm from a district where people literally board buses to travel across the border to Canada to obtain uh, their prescription drugs at lower prices. They do this for the very simple reason that Canada is able to price drugs at below genuine market prices here because of their unfair power in obtaining contracts with the drug manufacturers. Now, you heard um, my colleague Gil Gutnick talk about Prilosec costing nearly $100 here in America. Half of that is the cost in Canada and in Mexico at $17.14. Claritin, another example, costs $57 here, while it only costs $18 in Canada. And this is wrong, and, and uh, we're hearing colleagues on both sides of the aisle trying to address this. Literally, no health care plan at all in the United States is able to negotiate the same prices as is Canada. 
This is for the simple reason that Canada's health care system is a single payer system that is a, a health care giant. And we recognize that, but none of our insurance agencies or health care providers have, this, have that same kind of power. Some countries offer to pay the nominal cost of manufacturing a drug and, and uh, some profit and, and little else. Meanwhile, our drug companies agree with these propositions because they can still make a profit, leaving our citizens to pay the very high costs associated with research and development. It's very interesting. I find that last year, uh, uh, the New York Times, and I don't always quote the New York Times, but I find this interesting. The New York Times stated that in 1997, Merrick and, and Pfizer both devo devoted 11.2% 11 11 of revenue to research and development, while marketing consumed 28.9%. So the argument that the research and development is so costly that Americans must bear the cost, uh, it, in my way of thinking is without merit. So this bill simply would require drug manufacturers to sell at the same wholesale price, no matter which country they sell to, except for the same reasonable quantity discounts. We're simply asking that if the Clayton Act applies here uh, between buyers and sellers within the United States, that should also it should also be applied internationally because, Mr. Chairman, as we know, in 1963, I know that you were still just a little boy then, but in 1963, when, when Medicare first was instituted, um, health care delivery costs were not out, out of sight. And the promises of what Medicare would cost when, it, when Medicare was first instituted were reasonably low. We're making those same kind of estimates today, and yet we know uh, judging from what the cost, the escalation in the cost of Medicare has been, that it's probably going to be hundreds the times of in, in the amount of what is estimated actually in 10 to 12 years, those costs of prescription drugs. I have heard the argument that this is not a make market based solution, but Mr. Chairman, indeed it is. What is market based about um, a program that that allows for the for the government to provide the base costs to to the uh, prescription drug companies and uh, those large companies are few in number and so there isn't the same kind of competition that really would keep the market uh, the fair market system equitable so if we're going to institute this kind of program then for the sake of the taxpayers, for the sake of the senior citizens, we really do need to institute this kind of control that is simply equitable between countries. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I would, uh, I would submit to questions. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Chenoweth. We appreciate your, uh, <clears throat> your argument. And uh, I've just looked at an outline of your amendment here, and it uh, looks very interesting. I have no questions, Mr. Goss. You'd be interested to know, I think, that those folks are getting on buses and going to Canada for their pharmaceuticals, and I know that's true. You might be interested to know some of the Canadians are getting on planes and flying to Florida for health care because the other end of the Canadian system doesn't work as well as their prescription. And I think you have to look at some of these things on the whole basis, but I think your point is correct about the drugs. I hope we don't, in our, in our endeavor to uh, equalize the cost of all these things with the Europeans and the Canadians, do the same with gas prices. That would not be good. Uh, in response, um, Mr. Mr. Goss, I would like to say that the Canadians are getting on buses and going to Florida because they do get very good care down there because physicians are paid about three times under the Medicare schedule what they are in Idaho. So you see the inequities um, across the country. I know. We want the people from Idaho to come to Florida, too. We have great <laughs> health care, and we love it. But we'd like you to have good health care, I'll pass that on. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Goss. Mr. Hall. Mr. Linder. Some of these nations have um, forced pricing yes. by setting the prices we're willing to pay. Canada, I believe, is one. And my view is if we pass this bill, which I co-sponsor the Goodnight Bill, those pharmaceutical companies will begin to sell here for the same price just to have the market. Do you want other nations to be setting our prices? Because they will be. 
No, I think that the actual cost for R and D and and development and actually marketing. I don't I don't know whether you were in the room or not, Mr. Linder, when Mr. when Mrs. Slaughter brought up the point that that the uh, that the drug companies are now advertising uh, extensively uh, on television. Um, and you know, is that R and D? But um, well, I call it First Amendment. <laughs> they do. But nevertheless, um, I, I do think that the American taxpayer in the future will be bearing an unfair, unfair disproportionate amount of the cost, and other countries are benefiting from it. We, we have been bearing that, that for years since other nations have been involved in fixing prices. And we, so they don't develop drugs anymore. We, we develop almost all the drugs in the world. Well, if then if, if the drug manufacturer can, can sell a drug into Europe, at a certain price, they ought to be selling it at the same price here, and uh, and maybe cut down on some of their R and D and and marketing. Mr. Linder, uh, according to a 1993 report by the Office of Technology, in addition to general research and training support, there are 13 different programs right now specifically targeted to fund pharmaceutical research and development. And that same report noted. Of all U.S. industries, innovation within the pharmaceutical industry is the most dependent on academic research and the federal funds that support it. Mr. Linder, I believe that unless we can build some fences around the, the potential for escalating costs, um, that, the, that the taxpayers are going to pay, pay dearly in the future for, for this are. program. They already are. Ms. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think just Looking at the, the sheer number of members who testified on this one issue today, uh, it shows us how important it is and how troublesome it is and how many different solutions we have heard. Um, uh, and so uh, I have been listening to Mr. Gutnick and others over the last several weeks, and it's very intriguing. And I, I hope that we can come to some resolution, partially at least. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sessions, no questions. Chairman Reynolds, no questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> it appears that our final witness on this bill will be uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Capuano. And we're happy to uh, have you with us. And please uh, feel free to submit any prepared remarks into the record without objection. I'll appear there. And we welcome your summary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm here on two amendments, uh, one of which probably has no chance in hell, and the other one, you never know. Uh, the first one, which I think uh, will probably cost some money up front and therefore probably won't make it, yet I do believe in the long run will actually save us money, uh, is a, a bill to simply have re vision rehabilitation services covered by Medicare. Currently they are not. If you fall down or if, you're, if your parents fall down right now, break their hip, they get their hip repaired, then they go to rehab learn how to rewalk, learn how to live with a potentially lifelong injury, uh, learn how to change their habits, learn how to live with it. If, however, you are same parent, my mother is one of them, she lost her vision, uh, she loses her vision, there is no rehab services covered by Medicare. And if, if anyone wonders, because I never thought about these things until she lost her vision, if anybody wonders how difficult it is to simply learn simple things, when you lose your vision, close your eyes, pull out a check, and try to sign your name to the dotted line. Try to fill out what that check is for. Prescription drugs, whatever it is, rent. Try to fill out the numbers, try to balance that checkbook. Simple things like that. Try to put something in the microwave for 10 seconds. Try to figure out which pill is in which bottle when you need to take different medications. To me, those are simple things that we who have vision take for granted. I did. When my mother lost her vision, I realized how difficult it is. Yet all of those things can be learned and can be taught. And I simply believe that by doing that, we will actually save money, and here's how. Under the current situation, the estimation is that approximately 20% of the injuries of senior citizens are related to vision problems. You lose your vision, you go to sit on the edge of the bed, you fall down, you miss the edge of the bed. You try to cross the street, you miss the curb, you fall down. You break a hip, an elbow, a shoulder, whatever it might be. A broken hip costs approximately $35,000 to repair from start to finish, both the medical cost and the rehab cost. Vision rehab costs maximum, maximum about $1,000. There's nothing you can do for most of the people who lose their vision under current medical situations to turn around to reverse macular degeneration. It costs about $1,000 maximum to teach somebody how to use that cane. I wouldn't know how to use it. I wouldn't know how to get on a bus 
I wouldn't know how to tell the difference between a $5 bill and a $10 bill in my pocket right now, and I dare say probably no one here would. That's what this bill would do, yet I understand that up front, yes, it does cost money. However, I firmly believe that, number one, it will save us money in the very short term, and number two, will clearly be worth whatever it costs in uh, improved quality of life. The second item I'm here to talk about is, is, a, is, a little, is a completely different item. When it comes to the cost of prescription drugs, I understand that everyone here and everyone in America is trying to figure out a way to do this. We all want it. How do we get from A to Z? There's one thing, and in my district, we have the great benefit of having many research institutions and many research houses. They get a lot of federal money, a lot of it. Taxpayer money goes into investing into R&D for new drugs. I think that's great because when it comes to those kinds of things, I believe we have to do that. Most of those research dollars go down the drain because anybody who does any kind of science knows nine out of 10 times, you're gonna fail. You're not gonna find the cure for whatever you're looking for. One out of 10 times, you hit it. When you hit it, you get a 17-year patent and you can set the cost, whatever it might be. This proposal does one simple thing. It simply says, if the federal government, if the federal taxpayers loaned you or gave you money up front for research, if you hit it, we simply want our share back like any shareholder, like any investor. I look at it as taxpayer capitalism. And as a matter of fact, in order to keep, there's an argument that says if you take any of the money back, you kill the incentive, because one of the incentives to do this is, of course, to make a fortune. There's a cap. We'll take no more than 20%. But if the taxpayers give you 4%, of your upfront money, why shouldn't they get their 4% back? And under this proposal, that 4%, 10%, up to 20% would go right back into Medicare to pay for prescription drug coverage. I think it's kind of simple. I think it's a perfect tie-in. And if for some reason this Congress does not pass a prescription drug coverage bill that goes through Medicare, then whatever money is collected goes right back out to R&D. So if we can't get our own house in order and get together and pass some bill that works, I understand, that's fine. The money doesn't go to waste, it does not go to the general fund, it won't go to defense, it won't go to housing, it goes right back into R&D so that we can find the next cure for the next disease. Those are the two proposals I have before you, Mr. Chairman. I hope that you can uh, give them favorable consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Capuano. We appreciate uh, your testimony. It's very helpful. I have uh, no questions. Mr. Goss? Mr. Hall? Mr. Linder? Ms. Price? Mrs. Myrick, Mr. Sessions, Mr. Reynolds, thank you very much for being thank here. You, we sir. appreciate that. Uh, we're going to uh, conclude the, uh, <clears throat> the hearing on the, uh, the prescription drug bill and say that uh, obviously from the testimony that we've had this afternoon and this evening, it uh, is a very complex measure and we have uh, a wide range of uh, tough questions that this committee is going to be uh, facing as we uh, deliberate on this, and so we will uh, conclude the hearing portion. And as I announced earlier, we're not going to be reporting out the rule this evening, uh, so we'll be in recess on that. But before we uh, proceed um, on the uh, Energy and Water Bill, we'd like to take testimony from the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Saxton, who uh, sort of uh, in and out of the room, and we uh, understand the exigencies of your schedule, but we're happy to be able to put you in here at the end. And welcome, and let me say that your prepared remarks will appear in the in the record their entirety, and we'd welcome a summary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, actually, I'm here to uh, seek a waiver from uh, House Rule 21, uh, Clause 2, regarding authorization on an appropriations bill. And uh, I'll just briefly uh, describe the situation that uh, brings me here. Um, the uh, Delaware River, from the ocean to uh, Philadelphia, is some 90 miles in length. The main channel in the river is currently 40 feet deep and there has been a proposal now uh, in place for some years to deepen the channel from 40 to 45 feet. Uh, the uh, Corps of Engineers has done a series of studies uh, with regard to uh, both the uh, environmental impact of this uh, dredging project uh, and others have uh, estimated, uh, done estimates on uh, with regard to the um, uh, economic uh, impact and the economic return on federal dollars that would be involved in th this expenditure. There have been um, serious uh, questions raised on b with regard to both issues. Uh, with regard to the en environmental questions, uh, questions have been raised as to the uh, as to the levels of contaminants uh, in the in in the dredge spoils, uh, as to the placement of the dredge spoils, all of which, uh, for some reason or another 
apparently planned to be disposed of uh, uh, in New Jersey and uh, Delaware and Pennsylvania would, uh, for some reason, uh, not uh, uh, be a place where dredge spoils would be disposed of, uh, as well as the effect on the river uh, bottom uh, with, re with regard to the effects of dredging. And so uh, with, with that in mind and with the fact in mind that some of the industries uh, have reportedly said that they are not going to bother to dredge from the new deepened 45-foot channel to their docks because they don't think it's an economically feasible project, uh, it raises questions about the economics of the project as well. And so my amendment, from which I seek uh, relief by way of a waiver, uh, would direct the controller, uh, the controller general, to do a, the, a, the, of the general accounting office, to do a study to determine the economic and environmental effects of the dredging of the Delaware River. Uh, this project is 29.8 million dollars for the next fiscal year, and it would seem to me that an expenditure of that kind uh, should be looked at uh, thoroughly by an independent uh, agency, and the GAO, I believe, uh, would uh, be um, that agency. Uh, in addition, I guess I would just say and, can, and conclude by saying that this uh, study would be six months in length and that uh, while the monies would be appropriated by, by uh, way of the normal process, they would, they would not be able to be expended by the Corps of Engineers until the uh, study from the General Accounting Office was received and Congress had a chance to evaluate it. I think this is a common sense approach. It's uh, almost $30 million. There are questions that have to do with the environment. There are questions that have to do with the economics of the project. And so I ask your consideration. Well, Mr. Saxton, thank you very much for your uh, testimony. You and I have discussed this, and I want to congratulate you on your commitment <clears throat> to uh, addressing this issue. You've outlined it uh, very clearly. Thank you, Mr. Goss. I, uh, I have great uh, respect uh, for your uh, expertise in the area of the environment when it comes to these kinds of projects, you've done an awful lot over the years. And I uh, happen to agree with you totally on this project. I've seen a couple of other of these uh, channel dredgings where they have caused serious economic damage. And I would suggest that what's going on in the Thames River right now is killing the lobster industry and uh, some of the other fishing industry in Long Island Sound, which we're reading about in the papers because of ineffective studies and ineffective work that was done. Uh, that's an opinion. Unfortunately, I don't have a bunch of scientific fact behind it, and I don't know where you stand on that. But I think we do rush into these things, and uh, I have sympathy very much for what you're trying to do and certainly what you're stating. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall. Mr. Linder. Ms. Price. Mrs. Myrick. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you very much for being here, Mr. Saxton. We appreciate that. And that concludes the uh, hearing on the uh, Energy and Water uh, Development Appropriation Bill. <coughs> And uh, with that, the chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 4733, the Energy and Water Development Appropriations Act 2001, an open rule providing one hour of general debate divided equally between the chairman and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations. Rule Waste Clause 4 of Rule 13, requiring a three day layover of the committee report and requiring a three day availability of printed hearings on a general appropriations bill against consideration of the bill. The Rule Further Waste Clause 2 of Rule 21, prohibiting unauthorized <coughs> legislative provisions in an appropriations bill. And Clause 5A of Rule 21, prohibiting a tax or tariff provision in a bill not reported by a committee with jurisdiction over revenue measures against provisions in the bill. The rule provides that the amendment printed in the Rules Committee report may be offered only by a member des designated in the report and only at the appropriate point in the reading of the bill shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. All points of order against the amendment are waived. Members who have pre-printed their amendments in the record prior to the consideration will be given priority and recognition to offer their amendments if otherwise consistent with House rules. The Chairman of the Committee of the Whole may postpone votes during consideration of the bill and reduce voting time to five minutes on a postponed question. The vote follows a 15-minute vote. And finally, the rule provides for one motion to recommit with or without instruction. You've heard the motion of the uh, gentleman from Sanibel. Any discussion or amendment? Mr. Hall. Without objection, the administration's uh, statement will appear uh, in the record. Any further discussion or amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the motion of the gentleman from Florida. Those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Paying the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And Mr. Hastings will be managing this bill for the majority. And Mrs. Slaughter for the minority. And let me just announce that the, uh, the Rules Committee will, at this point, stand in recess, subject to the call of the chair. And uh, can't tell you exactly when we will uh, reconvene, but... Uh, we're going to stand in recess. Thank you all. It will be sometime.
explosion in one room. So that energy and water appropriations bill, one of the 13 funding the federal government for the new fiscal year, could see debate tomorrow on the House floor. Also tomorrow, we plan to cover tomorrow's meeting of the House Rules Committee as members continue work on the rules of debate for the prescription drug legislation, which was worked on earlier tonight in this committee, could come to the House floor as early as Wednesday. Meantime, the House continuing in session tonight, continuing work on amendments to the annual appropriations for the Departments of State, Commerce and Justice and the Federal Judiciary, and live House coverage right now on our companion network, C-SPAN. And tomorrow, the Senate returns for more work on spending bills for the fiscal year. Senators return tomorrow morning here on C-SPAN 2, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Choosing a new president is not a horse race, it's democracy. And that's why C-SPAN provides comprehensive coverage of Campaign 2000, from announcements of candidacy to the primaries 